This is the video regarding taking measurements and estimating uncertainties for the Physics 1101-1120 labs. The idea here is that there's no such thing as a completely precise measurement. In the real world, we're always going to have limits on how accurate a value we can measure. So in science, you not only record your best estimate for what the value is when you take a measurement, you also record what's called an uncertainty, which is an estimate of how far off you think your measured value is from the true value, whatever that might be. So to begin with, let's consider three voltmeters. So say you're taking a measurement of voltage across some resistor, and you've got these three voltmeters, and you don't know which one's best, so you hook them all up. And they're all accurate, so the needle on the dial goes to the same position in every single case. So just intuitively, which of these three scales do you think is going to give you the most accurate value? Probably you say the one with the most tick marks, because it'll be easier for you to estimate where the needle's position is. So let me zoom in and we'll take a look at each of these individually. So here's the first scale, and you'll notice that it doesn't have very many tick marks on the scale. It goes from 1 to 2, and there's only those two lines to indicate 1 and 2. Now the rule of thumb is that when it comes to reading a scale, you write down all of the digits that you're sure of and one estimated digit. So we know that the needle's position is at one point something. Something is going to be our estimated digit. So you would write down everything that you're sure of, so one point something, and then we now estimate a digit. And I'm going to estimate it to be eight. So everything I'm sure of, which is the one, and then one estimated digit, which is the eight. So let me scroll down to the next case. So this scale has more tick marks on it. So it goes from one to two, but now it's got markers for all the point one increments as well. So again, with this, we're going to just write down everything we're sure of, and then one estimated digit at the end. So I can see that the needle's position is at 1.8 something, and the something is again going to be my estimated digit. So again, I'd write down everything I'm sure of, 1.8, and then one estimated digit. And I'm going to write down four. Now it's totally okay if you estimate that last digit differently than someone else does. That's the nature of making an estimate. So let's go and look at the third case now. In this case, we've got even more tick marks. It's actually getting a little hard to see where the needle's position is. But if you look carefully, you'll see that it's past 1.83. So it's somewhere between 1.83 and 1.84. So I'll write down everything that I'm sure of, 1.83 and then I estimate the last digit, and I'm going to put it at 5. But we're not done yet. We still have to write down what's called our uncertainty. So like I said, an uncertainty is an estimate of how far off you might be from the true value, whatever that is. So we can't know the exact value. We've got our best estimate right here, and now we're going to write down an uncertainty, which will cover how much variation we think there would be between what we've written down and what the real value is. Another way to think about uncertainties is that it's an estimate of how much variation you'd see in this last digit from one person to the next. So let's go back up to the first case to begin with. We have to estimate how far off our value might be from the true value, whatever that might be. There's also a couple of rules of thumb that you can use for estimating your uncertainty. So the first rule of thumb is if the space between the tick marks is really big, then you can mentally subdivide this space into about 10 subdivisions and estimate your value based on that. So that means that one-tenth of this smallest division would make a good uncertainty. So over here, for my uncertainty, I would write 0 0.1. So going down to the second case, again, this is a pretty big space between the tick marks. So again, I'm going to use one-tenth of my smallest division as my uncertainty that works out to be 0 0.01. So again, the space between here is 0.1, and I can mentally subdivide that into 10 subdivisions, so I'm going to use 1 tenth of this smallest division as my uncertainty. Going down to this third case, however, we have to abandon that rule of thumb, just because now the tick marks are so close together that using 1 tenth of the smallest division is actually not realistic. We couldn't mentally subdivide that tiny space into 10 subdivisions. Instead, for a really small division, you use 1 quarter of the smallest division. So for this one, the uncertainty would be 0 0.0025. So let me now zoom out so we can look at all of these again. 
So to recap, when the divisions between the tick marks are really big, you use one-tenth of the smallest division as your uncertainty. And when the spaces between the tick marks are really small, like on a millimeter scale, for example, you would use one-quarter of the smallest division as your uncertainty. Now these kinds of uncertainties that we've just gone over, they're called reading uncertainties. They only depend on how good your eyesight is and the device that you're taking a measurement with. There are other kinds of uncertainty, however. There is also something called physical uncertainty and something called instrument uncertainty. So physical uncertainty comes about when the thing that you're measuring is not very well defined. So for example, if you wanted to measure the length of this fluffy bear, you immediately run into the problem that the edges of the bear are not well defined. So there's more going on than just the reading uncertainty, that is how fine the scale is on the ruler and how good your eyesight is. There's also the fact that you have to figure out where the edges of the bear are and you can't do that exactly. So in a measurement like this, you would put in your best estimate for the length of the bear and you would also include your reading uncertainty due to the ruler, but you would also add physical uncertainty to account for how big the fluff on the bear is. So, just intuitively, how would you come up with an estimate on what your uncertainty should be due to the fluff on the bear? Probably your plan would be to measure how big the fluff actually is, and then come up with an estimate on the uncertainty based on that. And that's a good way to do it. So for example, if we decide that this fluff is about one centimeter tall, then a good uncertainty would be half of that. So plus or minus one half a centimeter gives you the whole range of the fluff. So for this top edge of the bear, you would add plus or minus one half centimeter for physical uncertainty due to the fluffiness of the bear. However, you'll notice that the fluff on the bottom of the legs of the bear is slightly different in size. So you'd have to come up with a different physical uncertainty to account for the fluffiness level down here. So if this fluff looks about two millimeters long, then you could use plus or minus one millimeter of physical uncertainty to account for the fluffiness level at this end of the bear. Now before I tell you about how to tie it all together and come up with one value for your uncertainty, I'm gonna tell you about the third type of uncertainty that you might encounter, and that's called instrument uncertainty. So instrument uncertainty has to do with how accurately the manufacturer created their measuring device. So this metal ruler up here is actually really badly made. If you look over here on the left side, the zero mark and the 30 centimeter mark are lined up. But on the other end, they're not lined up. The length that the metal ruler says is 30 centimeters is actually a couple of millimeters longer than the length that the white ruler is saying is 30 centimeters. And I can tell you that it is actually the metal one that has been misprinted by the manufacturer. So this is an example of a device that has a rather large instrument uncertainty. That's actually pretty rare. Most of the equipment you're gonna use in our labs is quite accurate, such that you can usually ignore instrument uncertainty because it'll be so much smaller than the reading uncertainty. However, there's one important exception to that rule. When you've got a digital scale, such as this digital stopwatch, there is no reading uncertainty. You can see exactly what that value is. Therefore, it's not valid to say that the instrument uncertainty is negligible compared to the reading uncertainty. There is no reading uncertainty for a digital scale. So what would you do? In cases like this, the scientist would go and find the manual for the instrument and look up what the manufacturer says the instrument uncertainty is. Now in these labs, you'll always be told what the instrument uncertainty is on a digital scale. In fact, usually it's written in the apparatus section of the lab manual. So you would just go to your experiment, look at the apparatus section, and find your instrument uncertainty there. If it's not there, ask your lab instructor. They will tell you what the value is. Now, since I'm on the subject of exceptions to the rule, let me tell you about something else that you should be aware of. When you've got some measuring device and you've got, say, a needle on a scale, you've got this reading uncertainty. So for small divisions, that would be one quarter of the smallest division. When you're measuring a length, however, you effectively have two reading uncertainties because you've got to get the zero lined up with one edge of the object and you also need to take a reading off the other end of the object. And so for a length measurement, this is how you write your value is you actually add two reading uncertainties together to get the total reading uncertainty and then that's what you list next to your value. So for length measurements, just remember that you've got two reading uncertainties, one for lining up the zero and one for actually taking your measurement. So one more quick exception to the rule before I tell you how to put everything together. When it comes to stopwatches in particular, 
it's actually better to ignore the instrument uncertainty. Even though it's a digital scale and we have no reading uncertainty, we have another sort of uncertainty, and that's human reaction time. So the instrument uncertainty of your stopwatch is actually quite small, just 0.01 seconds, and human reaction time is over 10 times that large. So it's better in the case of a stopwatch to consider instrument uncertainty to be negligible because human reaction time should be added on as your uncertainty and it's actually quite a lot bigger. So now I'll tell you about how to tie everything together. So when you're taking a measurement, regardless of what sort of measurement it is, you would write down the quantity name, its symbol, and then your best estimate for what the value actually is, and then you write down your uncertainty, which is going to be the total of all sources of uncertainty. And then, right underneath this record of the measurement, you have to write down your rationale for why you chose the uncertainty that you did. And so you'd write down your reading uncertainty and what it was due to, the ruler in this case, your physical uncertainty and what it was due to, so the fluffiness of the bear, and then you'd write down your instrument uncertainty, which, if it's not a digital scale, is usually assumed to be close to zero. So more information is always better than less information, so you could write down two times one quarter, meaning one quarter millimeter is your reading uncertainty, at one end of the ruler, and then write down the total. For physical uncertainty, it's the same thing. They say how much physical uncertainty they had at the top of the bear, and how much physical uncertainty they had at the bottom of the bear due to the fluffiness of the bear. And this is, as I said, assumed to be negligible. And then they add these three together to get this total uncertainty. So in your record for the measurement in your lab book, you write down the total uncertainty, which is the sum of all the contributions. And then right underneath it, you do need to write down a rationale for why you chose the uncertainty you did. And I recommend you do it this way. Say reading uncertainty, physical uncertainty, instrument uncertainty. Say what it's due to, and then write out why you chose those values that you did.